Welcome back to Matt Presents, the show where I talk about the movie nights I hold every... Well, right now it's every week, but usually every other week. Just, just, just until the virus passes, you know? Um, probably mid-May. Probably mid-May is when we'll go back to two a week. Um, let's talk about those movies. So this week I showed House from... I think I said it was 1985. That's incorrect. It's from 1986. House is the story of a horror novelist whose rich aunt commits suicide, and he moves into the house that she used to live in just to, like, get away, to clear his mind, so he can get to work on his story, which is a memoir about his time in the Vietnam War. Um, his aunt was always convinced that the house was haunted. And ultimately that's what led her to commit suicide, believing the house was haunted. She, she said, there's even like a moment her ghost comes back and says that the house tricked her into committing suicide. William Cat moves into this house to write his memoir about uh, the Vietnam War, and all these kooky, ghostly, supernatural things start happening to him, and he has a bunch of flashbacks, and a bunch of very vivid flashbacks, uh, to the point where, like, people from his Vietnam days are invading the house. Also, and I didn't get this the first time I watched it, I, I'm glad I picked it up the second time, uh, his son went missing at the house, like, he and his wife visited the house with their son. Uh, he and his wife are going through a divorce in this movie. He, he and his wife and his son visited the house, and his son went missing while visiting the house, and they never found him. And at the end of this movie, he, like, travels into the ghost dimension and brings his son out back home, which... The first time I just... The first time I saw this, I thought his son was just dead. I didn't realize he had gone missing. So that was the one thing I was kind of not on board with the first time I saw this. I'm like, did, did he just bring his son back to life? But I was wrong. The house took his son years ago. Uh, they don't say how long ago. Two or three years, I would guess. They, they, they took his son a few years ago. The, the ghosts in the house t kidnapped his son. And so he has to get his son back before the end of this movie. Very wild horror comedy. Um, very Evil Dead 2-esque. Like, I assume this film took inspiration from the first Evil Dead. Um, but, like, it's... It's very similar to Evil Dead 2. Yet this came out a year before Evil Dead 2. So... Maybe Sam Raimi saw this movie, and this is part of the inspiration behind Evil Dead 2. Then again, Evil Dead 2 is so low budget, I'd assume they were filming, writing and filming long before this movie came out. Might just be coincidence. Might just be two movies that came out a year apart that incidentally had a lot in common. Um, but yes, a, a very Evil Dead 2 vibe from the film. With, like, like, there's a lot of creepy rubber zombie and ghouly creatures running around. There's, like, possessed weapons flying around. Um, the, the possessed weapons are part of one of the funnier gags in the film. Yeah, very enjoyable. If you like Evil Dead 2, I, I'd seriously suggest checking it out. Obviously, it's not as good as Evil Dead 2. Evil Dead 2 is one of the greatest movies ever made. This is fine. This is fun. It's enjoyable. Um, also bears a striking resemblance to Jacob's Ladder, um, a f horror film from, like, 9091. And it's weird, because it's like, this film is a parody of Jacob's Ladder, almost, but this movie came out before Jacob's Ladder, first off. Um, there are noticeable differences, like, this is about a haunted house, and 
that's just about like a guy being haunted by you know the demons of his time in Vietnam but they they do have that connection of like they're having these traumatic flashbacks to Vietnam and they can't tell how much of it is real and how much of it is fake and how much like ghosts and monsters are involved um so yeah, pretty kind of similar to Jacob's Ladder. Um, I might like this better than Jacob's Ladder. I don't know. They're both good movies. Um, this is the funnier version. Jacob's Ladder is a lot more serious. I would recommend both. I would recommend this and Jacob's Ladder. Um, this film is on Tubi for free right now if you're looking for it. Stars William Catt, the greatest American hero, and uh, George Wendt of uh, Norm, Norm from Cheers. So, um, to was Cheers big in '86? I don't know when Cheers came out, but two big TV stars, uh, uh, greatest American hero, had just gone off the air. Let me look and see when Cheers came out. Because I don't know my TV history very well. Cheers debuted in 82. So yeah, Cheers would have been big when this came out. Um, it's directed by Steve Miner. Uh, who was a producer on the first Friday the 13th. Directed Friday the 13th Part 2 and Part 3. Um, it was pro House was produced by Sean S. Cunningham. The director of Friday the 13th. And the stunts were done by Kane Hodder. Uh, famous for playing Jason in four or five different Friday the 13th movies. So very weird intersection between, like, all these all these people from different Friday the 13th movies and, like, a sitcom actors? That's a weird meeting of those two ideas. Good, fun movie. Um... The effects are fun, it's pretty creepy, it's pretty funny. I enjoy it. Uh, the second film we watched, which was kind of against my better judgment, but I went for it anyway, was Shark Attack 3 Megalodon. Now, I have said before on this channel, I fucking hate these, like, Jaws-ish movies. Like, Jaws is great, Jaws is untouchable, Jaws is one of the best movies of all time. Uh, and then there's Piranha. There's, there's Joe Dante's Piranha. Nothing else. Nothing else is even worth watching. Um, Shark Attack 3 was pretty fun. I'll admit that much. Um, as far as, like, these types of movies go, because most of them are just, like, so boring. It's like, ooh, Three-headed shark attack, or, or, you know, gigantic shark attack, or even just, like, Lake Placid or Anaconda kind of fall into that range. And it's like, they're not fun. They're not fun bad movies. They're just boring. Because they focus too much on the human characters, and the human characters aren't funny. The human characters have their moments in this one. They, they do keep it interesting. Um, I think what's really made this film infamous is the deaths. <laughs> There's just, like, a giant shark, and he just eats things whole. And that's really funny to watch. <laughs> um, my personal favorite is when, like, the billionaire executive is, like, escaping on a jet ski... He's like, haha, suck it, and then the shark just comes out and eats the jet ski. Very funny. Very funny scene. Do I have to explain the plot? It's the same plot as all of these fucking movies. That's another thing. The plots are always the same. It's like, oh, well, let me explain where this shark came from. I don't care. I don't give a shit. Half the time it's just a normal ocean creature. Um, in this one, it's like the the megalodon from 4,000 years ago is somehow still alive. Yeah, the deaths are funny. The, uh, the human parts are pretty funny. Although, for silly Jaws-inspired films, I don't think anything tops 
the official Jaws 4. Jaws 4 The Revenge is the only one of these shark movies that I think... It, well, I, I might... I'll, I'll put Shark Attack 3 Megalodon in that category. So there's two. There's two now. But uh, Jaws the Revenge is the better one. Two shark attack movies that are actually so bad they're funny. Because Jaws, Jaws for the Revenge is so ridiculous. It sets up these absurd rules about what the shark can do. Like the shark is specifically coming for revenge. And they can't even stick with that. It's like, yeah, the shark's coming for revenge, but, uh, eh, he's gonna stop and eat some other people and not get revenge first. I'm talking more about Jaws 4 than I am Shark Attack 3. Um, skipped Shark Attack 1 and 2. Um, from what I can tell, they're unrelated. It's not the same characters in all three movies, so more of an anthology series. Yeah, Shark Attack 3, I had heard from several sources, is like the funniest of these Shark Attack movies. So, I'm glad I checked it out. Um, not the greatest thing, but could probably worth a few laughs at a bad movie night. If you're like me and you're apprehensive about these like giant ocean creature movies, because you've been burned one too many times by three-headed Shark Attack, or Sharknado even, fuck Sharknado. Um, this one's, this one's probably worth checking out. It's fun. It's fun. But if you're looking for a great bad movie, Flyin' Ryan is one of my favorites. Uh, I talked about this on my show very early on, one of the earliest episodes. Um, it was before even I had a microphone, so the audio is like complete shit. And I'm very uncomfortable talking on camera, so I don't recommend watching that video. But, uh, it is a very funny movie. In fact, one of my friends specifically requested this. He's like, oh, Matt, please, can we watch Flying Ryan? And I'm like, all right, I'll see where I can work it into the schedule. So I got it in this week, and then he didn't even show up to watch it. But to be fair, he had personal reasons for that. I'll, that's fine. He can watch it some other time. Uh, Flyin' Ryan is the story of a boy who has to move in with his aunt. He and his mom have to move in with his aunt. Uh, after the death of his father, I think. And it's like their... Their family home, their family's lived there a long time. Several generations, at least. And, uh, one day his aunt gives him, she, like, finds a used pair of Heelys and gives them to him. Uh, but they don't have wheels, so they go out and they have to get wheels, and while they're out, they get, like, some, uh, like, model airplane pieces, because Ryan's grandfather was a very famous pilot, and he had a lot of model airplanes. So he takes these, like, model airplane reflectors and attaches them to the back of his Heelys. And that allows him to fly. Um, it is implied, but never directly stated. It is implied that it's his grandfather's ghost that helps him fly. Um... I've seen this movie, like, four times, and I did, like, an in-depth review of it, so that's how I know that. No one on a first viewing is gonna go, oh, it's his grandfather's ghost. No, you have to have that explained to you, or you have to watch this movie, like, five times to go, oh, it's the grandfather's ghost. Because, um, the house they move into is unnecessarily creepy. Like, the first, like, 20, 30 minutes of this film play out like a horror movie. But it's clearly for kids, so I don't know what the fuck's up with that. It's PG. It's a children's movie. So I don't know what the fuck's up with that. It's 
basically a well, one big commercial for Heelys, you know? Uh, there's even a logo for Heelys on the back of the box, indicating they probably had some financial stake in this movie. They, like, commissioned a movie to be a, a Heelys... That this is the Heelys movie. This is the movie that's gonna advertise Heelys to kids. Um, there's even... One of the bonus features on here is a commercial for Heelys, which I think is hilarious. Are Heelys still around anymore? Do kids still wear Heelys? I think they died off pretty quick because school started banning them. Because kids kept, like, scuffing up the floors and running into each other. That's my memory of Heelys. I remember when they first came out, and then I remember when they ultimately got banned from our school. Because um, they would scuff up the floors, and kids would run into each other. Bad times. I've watched the, uh... Director's commentary for this. It's directed by Linda Shane, who actually has some experience acting. She was in a movie called Screwballs, um, where she gets topless. So you can see the director of this children's movie, Topless, if you look. Um, I watched the director's commentary from her, and she mentions that they had plans to do Flyin' Ryan Goes Hawaiian. And of course, this movie did fucking nothing because it has no budget and is terrible. So they never made Flying Ryan Goes Hawaiian, and I'm so disappointed because I really want to see that. If I could have a sequel to any of these movies, any movie I've reviewed that could get a sequel, um, I'm going to say number one is Cool Cat Stops a School Shooting. But that's probably happening still. Uh, if. If Daddy Derek can get it made, it's gonna happen. But number two would be Flyin' Ryan Goes Hawaiian, because that sounds hilarious. It's one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. I Such an underrated piece of, like, bad movies right here. One of the greatest bad movies out there. And, like, no one knows about it. No one talks about it. Uh, hmm. They might have talked about it on Red Letter Media, but, like, I've Googled it before, and my video for it is, like, the third or fourth option. So it's... That says to me there's not a lot of interest in this movie. Flying Ryan, if you haven't seen it, highly, highly recommend it. If you, would, if you want to do a review of it, if you're one of the people who watches my channel who does reviews, please review this. So, last week I asked you what your favorite movie I've shown on Matt's Fun Time Bad Movie Show is. I suppose you know mine. It's Creeping Terror. I've said before that's my favorite, like, hilariously bad movie. Um, as far as, like, unironic enjoyment, a lot of, like, the weed horror movies and a lot of the, uh, metal ween movies I show, I actually kind of like. Um, my number one is Drive Angry. I think Drive Angry is the best film I've ever reviewed. Because I, I think it's good. I actually really like Drive Angry. Um, and <laughs> honestly, second place is going to the film I'm working on a video for right now. So I guess technically that's not out yet. So arguably I can't answer with that. Um, Thursday. Expect it Thursday. Um, that's going to, As soon as that video comes out, that movie will be my number two favorite like, unironic enjoyment. Um, I like I liked Bong of the Dead. I think Bong of the Dead is actually a pretty good movie. Gonjosaurus Rex gave me some laughs. Um, uh, Black Roses, Rock and Roll Nightmare, Trick or Treat, and Rockula. All uh, movies I kind of unironically enjoy. Which is actually the only answer I got to this question. So, Abby said her favorite movie I've reviewed is Rockula. That's the only answer I got to that question. So, thank you, Abby, for your input. And yes, I agree, Rockula, fun as hell. Love it to death. Um, maybe I'll show it at a movie night sometime. Uh, although you're in luck, Abby. One of tonight's picks is directed by the director of Rockula. 
incidentally. <laughs> um, I found out after I posted that video, there's like a Rockula fan Facebook page. A, Ro a Rockula fan page on Facebook. And someone posted my review to the fan page. Might have been our friend Abby here. Um, <laughs> thanks for that, I guess. But yeah, Rockula, fun movie. I suppose my question this week is, what are your favorite anthology sequels or sequels in names only? Any sequel that doesn't directly follow up on the canon of the first film. Because we're going to watch House 2, The Second Story, which is an anthology sequel to House 1. Um, that's going to be the movie we're starting off with this week. And then to follow that up... Two movies I don't actually have boxes for, Ghoulies, and its sequel, Ghoulies 2. Um, Ghoulies was directed by Luca Beravocci, I want to say his name is. Luca Bercovici, directed, uh, directed Rockula, also directed Ghoulies 1. Um, and, of course, Ghoulies 2, which is somehow, like... I feel like I've heard more recommendations for Ghoulies 2 than Ghoulies 1, so Ghoulies 2 might be the better of these two movies. Those are my picks for tonight. Uh, I'll be back in a week to talk about those, and I'll recommend some new movies to you. Uh, until next time, I'm Matt, and have a good day.